It's Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. Kathy Swan finished up her first session in the Missouri House this spring. She represents much of Cape Girardeau in the House of Representatives. Kathy Swan, welcome back. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, first, let's talk about some uh, some education bills that that were passed this uh, this this session, um, in, in, including one that's for that's for veterans. Um, and tell us uh, tell us a little bit about this. Uh, there are a couple that affect veterans. One is that when a deployed veteran returns to Missouri, uh, he or she is considered to be a resident for purposes of tuition and admission. You know, obviously we all know that there isn't a residency requirement for students. Well, that will not apply. They're considered a resident for that purpose when they return. The second... So this would be any veteran that, that may be from Michigan or elsewhere can, can move to Cape Girardeau or to Missouri, excuse me, and they'd be considered as a, a resident know, for tuition. That is my understanding. Uh, we'd have to look at the bill language to know if someone was a brand new resident of Missouri, but that would seem to make sense because obviously if you lived in Missouri and you returned to Missouri after mm -hmm. being um, returning out from the military, you are a Missouri resident, so that, that would seem to make common sense in that situation. The other one is for any specific training or certification uh, gained in the military in a certain area that that certification and training could be viewed and looked at by institutions of higher education or proprietary schools in the state uh, for comparable credit. So that's good news for, for those who, who receive training or certifications while they're serving in the military. Well, let's talk a little bit about another bill, uh, an education bill that uh, provides scholarships um, for, for students with, with special needs. It is, it's Price's Law. The mm -hmm. state representative who worked on that has worked on that for about seven years, uh, having had a family member uh, that uh, had autism. And actually that is a tax credit for our contributions that are made to scholarships for special needs students, particularly those with autism or other uh, learning disabilities. Go ahead. That, that particular bill also had a couple of amendments added on that would establish the Career and Technology Advisory Board for the state and one for gifted and talented education for the state. And uh, another bill that, uh, that passed um, requires schools to have somebody on staff that's, uh, that's trained in caring for, for children with, with diabetes. Uh, why, yes. why, is this, why was this type of bill necessary? Uh, you know, if you have a child who is diabetic, uh, and actually from the nursing background, that's uh, a, a diabetes that is less mm -hmm. easily controlled and a blood sugar less easily controlled in a child than it would be an adult later in life. So those children need a watchful eye, obviously, uh, particularly the child is on insulin uh, and watching diet. And if there would be an incident where a child needs special attention because of that diabetes, there needs to be someone on the school property that has the proper information how to care for that child. You know, talking about education, uh, you're also sitting on an interim committee uh, for education. What exactly is this, uh, is this committee looking at right now and uh, where will you be making appearances and such? Uh, the committee wants input, wants input from the state. We discussed a variety of topics. We've had one meeting in Jefferson City uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, a variety of things, obviously funding, um, anything that comes before people that they're interested in. We're really trying to get their thoughts and their ideas about education, about teacher, about uh, graduation, anything that is of interest to them. Uh, we will meet around the state uh, on bus tour uh, that we're working on finalizing arrangements for, but the plan is to travel the southern part of the state the last week in September and then the middle and northern part of the state in the last week of October. Now there's a um, there's a veto session coming up in in September, um, and one of the bills that that Governor Jay Nixon vetoed was uh, an income tax cut bill. That's right. Uh, and he since um, withheld funds for education, saying that this is th this this would be necessary if that if his veto was was overridden. What's um, wh what's your reaction to the, to the governor's actions on this? Well, that particular income tax bill would have been the first in almost 100 years for the state of Missouri, and there were three different main portions of that regarding the income tax. One would be is a phase-in of over uh, five years of a reduction of a half a percent 
in personal income tax. Another one was up to a phase in of 50% deduction on business income for small businesses that are taxed as individuals. And there was not a phase in period for that one. Um, so year 2014, they would immediately start, or excuse me, not a phase in period. I'll explain what I meant by that. That's an error. Uh, there is a phase in period for that. Um, but So the first year would be 10% reduction. Mm -hmm. The last one is a reduction of up to 3% on corporate income tax. Now, the, the reduction on the personal income tax, the reduction on the corporate income tax would only take effect if the general revenue would grow by at least $100 million from the previous tax year. Mm -hmm. uh, the small business one would not uh, make that requirement. The thought process is that we're not certain. We, we don't know if we're going to have the money. However, there are a couple of factors at play here. The budget that was submitted, which is about $8 billion that the legislature and the governor have um, the ability and the responsibility to appropriate. Mm -hmm. Of that money, the projected budget uh, came out from the General Assembly with a $150 million surplus. Now, we've had a $742 million increase in revenue from this end of this fiscal year over mm -hmm. 2012. So we've had about a 10% growth uh, from one fiscal year to another. The other point is constitutionally, uh, the governor may not have the ability to withhold if revenues exceed that on which the budget was created. So there may be an issue regarding the legality of withholding in this situation. Now, this was a, a, a bill that you supported uh, uh, this year. Now, is, is this something that you'd also support in the, uh, in the veto session to override the... To yes, override? I will. Yes. Yes, I will. Let's, let's talk a, a little bit about, um, about another bill, which was the, uh, the big workforce development bill that was, that was talked about, which was the uh, prevailing wage. Uh, yes. The prevailing wage bill. This was passed. The governor didn't sign it. Um, give us a little bit of background. What exactly is prevailing wage, and, uh, and, 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 and why was it something that, that, that gathered support from the legislature? Prevailing wage, uh, the end result is that construction of public buildings, uh, the workers working on that construction will be paid a prevailing wage. And the wage is that wage that is most often reported for a given occupational title within a given area or a given county. Uh, where some of the difficulty comes from, particularly in outstate counties, is our wages are not quite what those wages are in the metropolitan areas. And for some of these occupations, there are little to perhaps no reportable wages. So we default to the metropolitan, or the state's rather, collective bargaining agreements. So some of the wages that are paid, many believe, for these construction workers on these jobs is significantly higher than would normally be paid, therefore costing tax, more taxpayer dollars for the construction of that public building. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple more interim committees that you're on. You're on one for Medicaid transformation. Uh, tell, us a, tell us a little bit about that. There are several Medicaid committees at this point. There was one that was <laughs> legislated. It's a joint committee, Senate and House. There is one that's traveling the state and has citizen membership on it as well, taking input from communities as we're doing with the Education Committee. And then the one that I, on which I will serve is legislators. And we will take that information. It's Medicaid Transformation Committee. Uh, we will take that information uh, gathered from the roadshow uh, and come up with some recommendations regarding Medicaid. Go ahead. The, um, the other committee is legislative infrastructure and process, and that particular committee will study how the House operates and develop a blueprint for more effective, efficient operations from now and into the future. And will this be one that also has a, a bit of a road show that goes along with it and traveling the state as well? We have not met uh, yet. So, you know, and I, 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 I always think, well, we're going to meet over the summer because school starts in <laughs> September, so we'll go back. But actually, we have until January before we go back. So we've not met, had our initial meeting. So I'm uncertain as to what the schedule might be. Now, uh, real, real quickly, before we, before we finish, um, you just finished your first term. What was your reaction? What, what was your impression of your, of your, of your, of your, of your first session in the, in the legislature? Extremely busy. 
Uh, time is very valuable, but hard to find. Um, and I've likened it to riding a bicycle, that one must jump on that bicycle. There are no training wheels, and you better be taken off because you'll re be run over by everyone else. Um, great workload, great information. We've been talking today with Kathy Swan. She serves in the Missouri House of Representatives. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.